Hi, welcome everyone, uh, and welcome, Mundi, to our very first episode of yet to be titled series of interviews. <laughs> um, you guys can hear me okay? Yeah. So, um, so we're just going to go through a list of questions and uh, and have the answers be as long or as short as you want, and yeah. we'll go from there. Okay. Cool. Um, first of all, do you want, maybe we can do a little intro. Do you want to introduce ourselves for the forever for whoever's listening? Yeah. Yep. You want to go first? <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, my name is Lindy Zimmer. Uh, I am a public artist and uh, also consider myself a teacher and art advocate. And I live in Denver and I've been painting professionally for the last nine years. And <clears throat> yeah, I really, especially in the last couple of years, have really ramped up to focus on like social justice along with like environmental justice and um, kind of just uh, elaborating on what that looks like within my painting practice and my public murals. Did you grow up in the area? Are you? Are you I grew up in Boulder. Boulder. Yeah, I was born and raised in Boulder and um, actually um, got my start <laughs> painting murals in Boulder when I was in high school and then went to college in Fort Collins and got my degree in art education, taught for a couple of years, and then kind of made my way into being an art director up in Fort Collins, lived there on and off for 10 years, and then moved to Denver. Um, it'll be, it's like two years exactly I've lived here. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, are there any, uh, are there any artists off the top of your head that, uh, that you studied during that, during that time up in Fort Collins or mentors that you feel like were impactful? Um, you know, as far as, uh, like professors go, I ended up going the route of, I got my minor in sculpture because I didn't like all the other programs being so rule oriented, like, you know, painting and photography, they have a lot of history and like kind of like rules and procedures as far as they go. And so sculpture was something, Gary Voss was my teacher and he was very encouraging of kind of like, do what you want. And um, mm -hmm. which is something I really take into, um, into my practice, like even as far as murals, what I did with Streetwise last year uh, of like cutting out heads and then attaching them to the wall. So there's a sculptural element and I, you know, I do paint 2D, but I really encourage like myself to kind of like think outside of that whenever possible. And um, yeah, other, other artists or mentors, um, you know, I always looked, especially when I was in Fort Collins, definitely looked towards the, the Denver art scene a lot. And mm -hmm. like, for example, like um, Jaime Molina and definitely um, I always looked up to him as far as a muralist in Denver and creates really strong, amazing work. And um, it's cool to be, you know, in the same kind of, category I guess <laughs> as somebody who like looked up to when when I was in Fort Collins especially the art uh scene there was like very um in the same way that like Boulder struggles with like getting public art and funding and kind of getting that out there um I worked really hard to um get things going in Fort Collins and it felt like I didn't have necessarily the people who were painting murals in the way that I want like saw in the rest of the like nation and also world um, so yeah, long-winded, but I'm long-winded, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had nothing but time right now, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about other, uh, other interests that you had, um, early on when you started to kind of get more serious about your art making? Um, are there other interests that you would like to name outside of kind of uh, the art world or, uh, creative thinking? Maybe recreation activities or like yeah so, so i graduated in 2010 from csu and i got my degree in art education and sculpture um so then when i graduated i actually traveled for a year i lived in a tent for a year <laughs> um as my mom would say you're homeless <laughs> but Home yeah so me and a partner at the time um we hitchhiked around the united states and then we also um hitchhiked around south america and we were climbing um doing traditional climbing at that time. So just being outside, we also worked on a lot of organic farms. And um, yeah, so I would say like 
being outside, I'd say nature um, really influences my art as far as like we are from the earth. And so everything that I do kind of reflects like our relationship to that in some way, even if it's not overt, it's like always subliminally something I'm thinking about. And I draw a lot of inspiration, obviously, from just patterns and textures in the world and just the curiosity and kind of like, you know, stillness and also chaos that comes from nature. And um, yeah, I feel really energized when I'm outside and I feel really, um, I actually have tattooed on my leg. I have make more art and then I also have breathe. So it's kind of like the balance between making art is a very like inward feeling and it's like very can be chaotic and like manic at times but then you know the balance to that is like being outside and being like outward and like kind of connecting to this to the other to the like expanse of the entire universe and that is something that yeah I would say really informs me <laughs> and that like rock climbing is something I'm very passionate about I don't do it as much as I'd like to um now because I do a lot of art <laughs> but um yeah, it's just like, I've learned a lot through the different like recreational things I've done outside, like climbing, you learn so much from, you know, it's not about your like physical strength so much as it's like your mental strength, which is the same when it comes to say painting a big mural or painting, like when you're a public artist and you paint large murals, it's like a very physical demanding job. It's not, you know, you're not in the kind of like protect, protection comforts of your studio where you have like climate control and like all the things you need like you know painting murals and anyone who paints large-scale murals they know it's like you're out there you're out in the elements and you're yeah. you have to like mentally kind of like click into a zone and yeah I think that a lot of people I know who paint murals definitely have uh, a sort of zen way about them you get in a zone you know and you paint yeah you'll be painting for 15 16 hours outside uh -huh like no matter the elements like mm -hmm. I painted in Boulder um the mural uh, that's on the Boulder Creek path under 30th um I painted that and it was like snowing most of the time <laughs> it was like really cold and then I and then I continued to paint another mural um in December right before Christmas um this big really big mural like 125 feet by like 20 feet um downtown Denver and like yeah my paint was like freezing the whole time but like <laughs> from my experiences of you know doing some really challenging outdoor activities like climbing doing big wall climbing and like having a lot of epic adventures where like you know you almost die <laughs> <laughs> painting for like a couple days outside when it's cold it like definitely like changes like once you've experienced like a really challenging kind of thing you know physically and emotionally you know that you can like get beyond that and that's uh -huh. what's so cool about doing especially outdoor activities that push your ability and also what you think your ability is like uh -huh. you know whether it's running like long distance running or mountain biking you know and there's varying levels of all of it but really it gives you the resolve to understand that you have a lot more capacity than you do and mm -hmm very again long-winded but it kind of all circles back around to why do I have the drive to paint you know large or to paint you know certain things in these like environments and places that you know are not necessarily easy and it's like uh yeah from my other passions the other things that drive me um I've gotten a lot of like mental fortitude um to be able to do these things yeah. and um yeah, and those are, it's, it's cool to me to, like, have had those experiences, and yeah, like, I lived in a tent for a year, like, we hitchhiked, it was mm -hmm. really interesting at times, <laughs> so, like, I feel like everything, people are like, I can't believe you do that, or whatever, and I'm like, everything's kind of, like, down here now, compared to where the, like, threshold of, like, pain and, like, mm -hmm. type two fun is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's healthy for us to um, see how the different activities in our life inform inform each other. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me it makes me wonder what percentage of your studio practice is um, outdoors versus in the studio, um, because I I, uh, I I get what you're saying about um, kind of the hermetic safe 
process of being in the studio versus being out in the elements. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm curious because it, it, it seems your process seems a little bit different to me than like a traditional kind of mural painter because there are some things that you have to do in the shop, right? Like the cutouts and yeah. um, the pre-painting or whatnot. Yeah, well, you know, to be honest, I really do everything I can to be outside. Like, uh -huh. so even like, uh, you know, other than I have to rec like uh, charge my computer right now, I sit outside and work on my computer in our backyard and then... I made a studio space outside of my studio so I can like work on my computer outside because I still have to do a lot of computer work. Um, you know, a lot of people don't say it, but you know, 80% of being a muralist is just emails and like kind of the in-between of like designing and going back and mm -hmm. forth on things. Um, but that being said, yeah, I do like to work outside. I have a studio, but really I feel the best and most connected when I'm painting when I'm painting outside. Yeah. And um, I traveled in India and Sri Lanka at the beginning of this year before the uh, before COVID-19 hit and I actually like left early from Sri Lanka to come back. But man, it was so amazing because my process with the weather being so nice there or just hot all the time. <laughs> I got to do everything outside. You know what I mean? Like just painting outside consistently. Mm -hmm is just like, it makes me so happy. And I, so, you know, not even my studio process, I would say is like, yeah, I make stuff in the studio, but everything I can bring outside, I do. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, oh, I'll cut outside. I'm like, or I'll paint as much as I can outside. Um, and yeah, I just generally, especially when the weather's right, like we have like pr primo time right now. And mm -hmm. I like being really hot too. <laughs> Like, I don't mind being, like, super scalding hot. I was born July 24th, 1987 in Boulder, and it was the hottest day of the year. I think it was, like, 107 degrees or something. <laughs> so I consider myself a very – I like to be hot versus being cold. Um, it, I'm, a, I'm from the L.A. area, and I noticed uh, when I came out to Colorado that um, there still is people that paint murals out in the cold. Uh, versus like in California, it's, it's, there's like murals, it, you can do paint murals all year, but yeah. uh, in Colorado, it's it's absolutely a different physical task when your paint, oh. paint won't dry, your paint's cold. and It's uh, it's really crazy. And it's hard to say whether I'd rather be cold or hot, like the scalding, terrible hot that is coming. Uh -huh. Because like right now, of like being outside in the middle of the day on a hot wall, because it's the, the temperature can be, you know, maybe 115 degrees phone always shutting down, phone always like going like, I'm too hot. <laughs> like, That's your phone's voice? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I would much rather, like being in India actually was hard because it's so hot and there's, um, you know, the culture is um, very conservative as far as dress. Like even wearing like this would be um, inappropriate. So you always want to have like pretty much you can show this bit, but having arms covered and wearing pants. And when I was there, I was like, you know, just dying hot when, it, you know, it'd be like 90 degrees and like 70% humidity. And I'm just like, uh, <laughs> coming, coming back here and then like getting ready, gearing up for mural season. Um, I'm like, I'm just going to wear a bikini because I can. I'm like, Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, culturally, I don't have to worry about it. I'm just going to be out there, short shorts and a tube top. <laughs> like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the the painting outside, I think it's not so much the weather that I appreciate. I really appreciate um, interacting with people on the street is really what like public art is for me. And I like talking to people. I really, I absolutely love it. And I, I was trying, I was struggling last year with figuring out what, was so challenging for me when I was like doing restaurant jobs or kind of more like, you know, inside jobs basically. And what it comes down to is I just like, I feel so much more alive when I'm outside and I'm like interacting with people. Cause like painting inside, you're really only accessing a small portion of the community. And that's the only mm -hmm. people who are going to access that through whatever means it is that the building is like, it's an office, maybe only 20 people use that office. It's like, you know, it doesn't really reach that many people. Whereas like something like that's on the street, you know, the, I'll just, since it's in Boulder, 
um, on the bike path, you know, probably, I don't know, a couple hundred people go past that mural on the bike path every day, if not more. And that's really cool because that influences that space and that influences how people think that's part of their journey. That's part of the community. It's part of what they think of as the culture of that space. And it defines um, a really like positive part of a city and or like community. Whereas like, I'm not saying that doesn't happen with a mural inside. For sure it defines a space and it enhances the space for the people that utilize it. But really the reason why public art is such a huge deal to me is that you don't have to have a, a ticket or an access pass to get into it. You know, anyone can come see it. Like whether you're homeless, whether you have money or you don't have money, it's like it's in a public sphere. And so it's everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can we can we uh, can we pull up that image, Leah, of um, the Streetwise from 2019 mural? Linda, do you mind talking to us a little bit about um, about this piece and kind of your thoughts around making it? Um, yeah. Title of the work, whatnot. Yeah, I'm actually pulling up what I wrote about it because I can't remember everything. <laughs> Um, so just with Streetwise being kind of, you know, whatever, whatever you wanted to make, you know, kind of like, um, you know, political or to like bring activism into it. Um, I think about water a lot. Um, I think about access to water and clean water being our most valuable resource, um, as a planet and that, um, there's such a small percentage of clean water on the planet in comparison to people and Colorado especially like if um, anyone who's been here for a long time like you know it's dry as heck like we're an alpine desert it's really dry I'm like a lizard all the time I can't put enough mm -hmm. on. and so I you know even meeting people or being around other people from you know places that have even just more humidity like somewhere like Louisiana you don't even think about water in the same way. It's just, it's annoying if anything, but here in, in Colorado, um, water scarcity is something that we're gonna, as, um, as people continue to come here, um, because Colorado is a very desirable place um, and we have legal weed, you know, it's the only reason people come here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as people come here, um, you know, it really changes like, how we're going to be utilizing water and and where it gets allocated so um also because of the rocky mountains um we're considered a headwater state and so basically everything flows off to both sides of us so because we have such um high mountains and a lot of snowfall we get we have a lot of water up in the alpine area but um i'm going to read a little bit of what i posted about this um so just we have so Colorado's eight major river basins and aquifers and um, early settlement didn't really conserve or protect um, water and so with the increasing demand of water like for example Colorado's population um, grew uh, substantially like between 2017 and 2018 like 80,000 people and something that a lot of people don't know is the majority of the water that we get on the um, on the uh, eastern slope, we get from the western slope. So the the majority of the water actually comes comes through the Colorado Big Thompson Project, which is a federal water division diversion project to collect water from the western slope to bring it over here, which is really like kind of freaky to think about when you start thinking about water and you being from LA, like LA also has like, has a lot of water issues as far as like, there's such a huge population and it's a place that isn't like, isn't abundantly like um, with water. So anyways, to like kind of wrap it up, it's just like something to bring awareness to the water scarcity and to where our water comes from and how we utilize water. Like, you know, anywhere from like, you know, turn off the tap when you're brushing your teeth, but that's a small thing versus like, you know, understanding how policy and who owns water rights and then also like how water is being allocated to different places within the state 
And then also just being, um, yeah, conserving in like bigger ways insofar as like taking less showers or even like zero scaping your lawn so that you're not just throwing potable water onto the earth. <laughs> um, but so yeah, and then the people, there's kind of like the, the blue person is with water and then the brown person's like with water and it's kind of like looking different directions to um, just show and raise awareness about the possibilities and kind of our current state with water scarcity. Does this piece have a title? Um, I think I just titled it, uh, yeah, Water Scarcity in Colorado, <laughs> just really to the point. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but I really enjoyed doing this. It was pretty, it was actually a little more challenging to kind of like mm. oh, put it into the wall than expected, but I luckily had some, some help. And I enjoy when I have like kind of free reign on projects because I do sometimes do a lot of, um, yeah, projects that are more, uh, you know, geared towards a um, marketability sort of thing, which is not to say that this wouldn't be marketable, but it's it's cool to be able to like kind of voice a different opinion and more, more so than ever where my work is going and being that I have a, a, an okay platform and I, I think that it's personally really important for artists to um, voice issues that are um, maybe not talked about and we have um, especially now more than ever I mean it's always current but for people to really like say you know say what's happening and um, bring attention to those those different subjects. Um, as as uh, Leah, can you pull up that picture again with the um, with the finished mural? If I can go out on the limb and and kind of look at like maybe as an outsider interpret what it is that I'm seeing in the work and let me know um, how you think of that. Yeah. Because I, I feel like uh, with um, I just have like a. I don't have the whole. We have a blue box. We have a blue strip. Yeah. Oh. A blue strip. Um, there we there go. Um, in light of, of kind of uh, so much that's that's going on in the political landscape, um, I can't help but kind of uh, see that the the feed on the left has. Um, I feel like there's more abundance of water with the with the blue figure, and then on the right, it seems more like a the potential of of water being there, but at times that are being drought, um, things like that. Just yeah. kind of looking at the, the cool and the warm, um, and the the figure on the right, uh, the figure on the right has kind of uh, <laughs> it's like brown qualities. It's like like a, so it 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 makes me think of the the potential of people. Um, the ethnicity of people also determining their availability, or like the availability of water for them. Um, I can't help but go there when I look at that. I'm just kind of yeah. curious what you think of, of if, if someone might think that about the work. Yeah, I mean, you definitely hit the nail on the head with like, yeah, there's only one wave um, in the figure on the right. And yeah, this is kind of like the abundance or like this is, um, you know, having <clears throat> having the resource. And, you know, maybe this is also the past versus future, but not to make it so grim, you know, we are, we are going to deal with water scarcity more and more as climate change, as like the climate crisis kind of evolves. And it's actually interesting with bringing up, yeah, how is this affecting, um, you know, how is this affecting people of color? You know, like, does this affect, um, you know, certain people more than others and like the environmental impacts of climate change and how it affects different groups of people is like, I mean, it's historic already. We already see it playing out right now. Um, environmental injustices like predominantly happen to, you know, black people and people of color putting, putting that they're positioned in places that have less, you know, whether that be water yeah. or other places where companies have put, um, you know, different manufacturing facilities or fracking or all these things that ultimately 
are, um, yeah, injustices that brown people have to have to uh, contend with. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because it's something I've been really, I mean, it's been really hard the last couple weeks because it's like a conversation that I've always felt like I was participating in, but I wasn't as far as like the racial inequities in the United States and like doing more education recently. It's, it's just, um, it's so unfair. The, um, the oppression that has continued for, um, black and brown people in the United States and the things that they've been subjected to and are continually subjected to based on policy and um, systemic racism and that like environmentally like how are we you know water scarcity this 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 piece like what does it mean now it's like how are how are people disproportionately being affected by that in Colorado you know how is how is the climate crisis you know going to affect different people in Colorado and I think that's a conversation that you know needs to be had and um really it comes down to policy change you know we need to be more active as people um as participants in local government and uh, i encourage anybody who's watching this to really tap into their local politics because you have a voice and it really matters and i think for a long time myself included i was like kind of on the sidelines of like, well, it's like not that, it's not my problem, it's not my fight, you know what I mean? Whereas like um, with COVID-19, just like everything, like everything that's been going on um, in the United States has been really, it's like, well, if we don't say something or do something, it's like, you're complacent, you're part of the problem, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you can't sit around and complain about the government or the things that are existing or, um, you know, have all these opinions if you're not willing to do something and like stand up and make actions, you know, and mm -hmm. everyone can do their part. Um, another thing that I, I wanted to ask you about as I'm looking at this image, um, one of the things I noticed is that um, these two figures, um, I'm enjoying looking at them as kind of um, not having so many identifiable um, kind of features. Mm -hmm. They could be uh, they could be um, any gender. They could be any nationality. They could be. It kind of reminds me of a. Uh, of, I think there was a show at the Museum of Nature and Science when it was like the um, the Body World. Like, yeah, Body World. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of that. Where when I'm looking at those things, I'm not thinking about um, where this person grew up or. Uh, what their kind of like um, um, ethnic politics are. I'm just kind of looking at them at, as human beings. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I go there when I look at this, I, uh, when I start to think of them as kind of um, with gender or um, with uh, ethnicity, it quickly doesn't allow me to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm really enjoying it. I think that's hard to do. I think yeah. it's hard to kind of, um, create images that can be universal like that. So I'm enjoying that for sure. Um, I really appreciate you seeing that and, um, and bringing that up because it is something that I focus on a lot. I, I definitely have previously and currently focus a lot more on like gender as a social construct and that mm -hmm. I don't, I do like to try to remove those layers that can make people feel like they can't see themselves in the work. You know what I mean? I like that you could look at um, this, these, these people, these figures and be like, yeah, they're people, you know, and mm -hmm. not to like, not to be like, not to like, be like, oh, I'm colorblind. I don't see color, but instead like kind of like pooling it all together of like mm -hmm. putting it all everyone to the same like melting pot of that, like something I bring up a lot in my work is that we're all connected. You know, we mm -hmm. all, come from the same fabric we all we evolved into different versions but really ultimately like having melanin or in your skin or to like subscribe to this gender or that gender it's like those are all things that pull us apart in ways and 
like I, I want the viewer to be able to see themselves in what I'm making. You know what I mean? And it's hard. I really like, I painted a mural last year for crush in Denver and it's two people looking at each other and I pulled the images off the internet. They're not people I personally know, but I, I choose people who, if I'm going to use a direct reference of someone, I really try to pick someone who looks very androgynous, but then also might be like multi-ethnic. And also that the people I'm using, I'm not, and it's really hard because I'm thinking so hard as like, especially now more than ever, I'm like, okay, I'm a white woman. Like where, how does my voice show up? How do I represent people? But then also not, you know, to, to really to honor and represent people without like flattening it all out. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like this really delicate balance, but that mural in Rhino, um, I was painting it and uh, this is why I like painting on the street so much. This, this couple came up, um, two females and they both were, um, they, they, one was from Ethiopia and I can't remember where the other one was from, but they were just so moved by the piece because it's two women looking at each other and it's a gay mural. It's about love being love. Like they don't have to be women to you, but that's how I painted it. But these, these two feminine people came up and were so, yeah, thank you. <laughs> were so like, they were crying. They were like, I feel so seen in this and I feel so represented. And like, you know, they were like talking about their family not accepting their love. And like, we just had a moment and like, it just was super emotional to see someone directly react with like, they saw themselves in this mural, you know what I mean? And yes, they, you know, you can um, look at like noses and mouths and kind of structures to be certain like ethnicities and whatnot. But, um, and it's really hard to not always like, I'm, <laughs> You know, it's hard to not always like make yourself in something. <laughs> you're like, True. no matter what, you're yep. trying to remove yourself, but you are your art. So it's like, uh -huh. I'm always gonna like kind of paint myself, I guess. But yep. in this, like, the, you know, that reaction of them seeing themselves in this mural was like, it's crazy, it's cool because that's what I'm trying to do. And to then see somebody, to see people so moved by it in the thing I'm trying to do is like, okay, well, that's, that's sweet. I'm like, I'm doing something. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, yeah, and like people, it. and people feeling validated in their expression of love, like through something I'm making and they, they can see that and they feel that it's like, that's, that's really why I make art. And that's why I'm a public artist, you know? Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah. You, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the Crush Project. Um, do you want to talk about um, some like an upcoming project that you have going on and maybe talk to us about how you're thinking about that? Yeah, so actually something that I really, with um, everything revolving around Black Lives Matter at this junction, I've really been taking a, taking a really deep look at my art practices and how I can include um, other people in my practice other than white people, like, you know, and how I can bring other people up in so far as like, I have a small like network and um, really what I went to school for was education. And now that I've kind of mastered my like mural career is like, how can I educate and help other people with like, if they want to be a muralist or a professional artist. So that being said, two things I'm doing that are, just my reaction to how I can help as a white person and be more of an ally. And um, that is, I've been, I'm doing a series. I, so on my Instagram, I've really like kind of taken, I've been trying to take my voice out of it um, as far as like centering myself in my art practice um, and really like really trying to elevate uh, black educators and black voices. And then also just being a resource for people. Um, and that being said, um, yeah, I've done a couple murals since, um, you know, in the last month, but I haven't posted them, but I did, I focused on this. I've contacted a bunch of people within Denver, um, specifically focusing on femmes 
um, black activists and focusing on them and doing portraits of them basically. So I did one over at Taxi, which is owned by Zeppelin. It's over um, in the Rhino Arts District. But um, <clears throat> I did a portrait of this woman, Olivia, and she's actually just graduated from CU and she's an activist and poet and she's super young, but she's also super active. She's been super active and I saw her speak at a couple protests here in Denver and I just really was drawn to her energy. And so I asked her if I could paint a portrait of her. And so I painted a really awesome portrait in taxi of her in the stairwell. So it's like a big, yeah, like 20 foot by 15 foot portrait of her that people get to see when they're going up and down the stairs. And then also just focusing on, so like I said, previously I've always just drawn pictures like of references. I've become, I'm almost like more of a portrait artist now. Like I'm definitely like, I still do abstract work, but I like the element of really getting people's, um, you know, ethnicity through even just lines. You know, the mural that I did in Boulder, like all the people, my mom came to visit and one thing she said, you know, and my mom being like, she's very art oriented, but she's not so well versed in the whole culture of it. And she like looked at all the people, there's like eight people I painted. Yeah, I think there's eight. But she was like, I can't tell the gender or race of any of these people. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So it was just the cool thing about painting color then with line is that, like I said, there's, um, there's certain things that you would be like, oh, I can tell if that's like an Indian person or an African American person. But really ultimately it's to, it's to kind of like shift that um, viewpoint of like seeing yourself in the, in the person that you're looking at, that it's just the humanity of a person and not to be like, it's so funny in all the conversations and thinking about like, um, like not seeing color. It's not to, it's not to like take away from that. It's to almost like be like, how can we, how can we just appreciate the beauty of people? you know, and how can we see their true, their trueness through lines. And also, um, yeah, so I do a lot more portraits now. So all those people are people I don't know, people I found as references on the internet. Whereas now I'm just going through the work of finding local people and asking permission to use their image. And then I'm um, giving a portion of my mural, um, giving a portion of my mural proceeds to them as like a thank you for letting me use their image and then they can either keep it or they can donate it um and it's just kind of my way of like redistributing funds um because i make fine money doing what i do and um you know i like i just hope to try to do a little bit to like help redistribute the wealth <laughs> and then also another thing i'm doing is um i'm actually at three o'clock um, meeting with an artist who is a painter and so I'm just working with um, kind of like emerging emerging artists to um, not like just work with me on projects so I'm paying them to work with me um, and kind of giving them skill sets that they wouldn't normally have and like focusing on yeah black youth and black younger people in Denver and how I'd like to see that evolve long term is man, I have so many ideas of like, you know, I run a nonprofit up in Fort Collins that paints murals and then kind of taking that nonprofit mural experience and then bringing that to Denver in the way of like, but really focusing on youth and really focusing on those experiences as kids. Because I had a really amazing experience in Boulder painting at the Boulder Public Library when I was 15. And I worked with an artist and we got paid to paint at the Boulder Public Library and it was such an amazing opportunity and I didn't even realize it until much later in my life like into my 20s how that shaped who I was of like I saw and had these skills um, transferred to me that I would not have known otherwise you know I mm -hmm. saw that painting murals was a livelihood a possibility I saw that it was fun you know even if I wasn't going to do it like for a job, it was something I really enjoyed. And to basically pass the torch on that, to be able to mm -hmm. lift people, lift 
especially now. So my roommate, um, previous roommate works at Cole Middle School, which is in the Whittier district, right by Five Points. They actually, he, he let me know they cut their art program. So like going into next year, they have no art program. They previously yeah. hadn't had an art teacher for two years. And this is like 80% free and reduced lunch. You know, most, most students there are, um, are kids of color and um, they now don't like, you know, those, <laughs> those demographics. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna get comfy over here. <laughs> <laughs> but those demographics like those um you know those voices need art the most you know not saying like certain people need art more than others but to have that as a way to pro process through grief mm -hmm. and process through pain um is so important and to also like honestly have something to be working towards and to just mm -hmm. know that you have a value outside of um you know, you have something to work towards and value outside of what you already think of yourself as like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of where my, um, focus has shifted in the last, um, I'd say since I got back from India, I definitely like, I still need to paint murals that pay me dollars so I can, you know, basically mm -hmm. I focus on making money so that I can kind of try to redistribute as much money as possible. And, and I've really focused on it this year more than ever because it's basically like, okay, these are all things that are important to me. It's like, you know, after getting back from India and Sri Lanka and having some pretty like profound experiences there, like even without Corona, like already mm -hmm. things that I was thinking towards is like being in India and really seeing some really hard things and wanting to help, wanting to be like, how can I, how can I fix this? You know what I mean? Just being a person who's like, I can't wrap my mind around how, uh, how desperate and sad and terrible this is. And, to, and then to transfer that back to coming back to the United States and saying, what's in your hometown, like, what's where you are, how can you, like, how can you actively work towards affecting the people in your life, and the people in your community, and, mm -hmm. and it's hard, because it, it requires more work, it requires a little bit more planning, but it's also, like, doing the right thing isn't necessarily the easiest thing, so, like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, as far as, um, I'm painting a mural at Whole Foods, actually, um, it's um, actually being rebranded on Cap Hill um, to like ideal market. And I'm excited about that because they really did give some pretty big parameters of like, it's very community oriented. It's about healing. It's about um, our relationship with the earth and like, you know, they're huge supporters of organic agriculture and like the relationship between farmer and person, um, which like Whole Foods is not, it's so hard. It's like those really tricky situations of like, yeah, it's, it's owned by Amazon and that's like owned by Jeff Bezos. And I really don't actively want to support those sorts of corporations because they aren't doing anything good. And, you know, they're really, um, it's, I, I made a promise to myself last year to not work on projects that made rich people richer. <laughs> and, um, but it's also this project, I'm getting paid quite a bit of money. I can bring on a lot of people. I can pay like mm -hmm. six people to help me. So I can then also redistribute money in a different way. So it's like capitalism is inherently a really challenging system and it definitely is free market capitalism is not something that benefits people really. Mm -hmm. It's, um, and I don't support it. However, it's the system currently until we have a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> When we have like an actual breakdown of everything that's happening and a revolution, we still have to pay our bills with money. So I'd much rather redistribute that money um, the best way that I can with the little bit that I can do. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a, a list of questions, but I think the way that you answered these, you, you covered so many of the things that I wanted to ask <laughs> you. So, so thank you for that. Um, the last question I had was a uh, um, kind of a corny question, but I'm, I'm curious if you had advice for uh, 
for your, what, what advice would you give yourself to the, the young you who's just first starting out, kind of thinking about all this, um, being in a member list and, and incorporating that into, <laughs> um, so just, say, just um, advice to the yeah. younger you. Yeah, advice to the younger me, um, I would say, like, get out of your own way. Like, you have so much potential, and you you are going to do so many great things, and your um, your dreams will come true. You just need to stop standing in your own way of progress. And I'd say nine times out of ten, most people just stand in their own way of their dreams and their passions. And it's not other outside factors. It's really just like you saying, oh, I can't do that. And mm -hmm. some of the biggest rewards I've received in my life is from taking the biggest risks. And when I moved to Denver, after traveling, I drove around in my little geo for seven months and lived in my car. Mm -hmm. um, I quit my job at um, a really awesome place up in Fort Collins, but I was like help running the downtown artery. And then I also left, you know, all my friends and whatnot. And when I came to Denver, I said, I'm just going to do art full time. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is you go to get a job. You know what I mean? You're always constantly standing in your own way. And then, um, honestly, so on the 21st of uh, June, which was just a couple days ago, I celebrated a year and a half of not drinking. Um, and Congrats. Uh, I'd say you I too. Was, yeah. I've been sober since 2005. So nice. I <laughs> yeah, I would, I would tell my 20 year old self to probably just quit drinking. Uh -huh. because It's just like a waste of energy and money. And, you know, it's just like a emotional, it's a substance codependency that really mm -hmm. stood in my way for um, being my authentic self and like showing uh -huh. up and like, you know, hindsight being 2020, you can't, you know, you can't, go back and retroactively change those things. But I would say that to any younger person, especially too, is like really check in with the things in your life that bring you joy and happiness and check in with the things that take away from that. And mm -hmm. it's going to be different for everybody, but really like focus on working towards things that bring you joy and light. And it's great. I think that's, that's, that's perfect kind of full circle because one of the first things that you said when we got on here was um, you were talking about the idea of like endurance. Yeah. You know, endurance and, and raising the bar for yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and it sounds like uh, you've been doing a really great job um, doing that for yourself and then yeah. and uh, reflecting on that. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I Thanks for listening. I, I feel like I can be mm -hmm. quite a, a talky person, but I think it's... That's, that's what this is about, so... <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm like, give me a platform and I will talk. <laughs> One of the things that, uh, that maybe I'd, um, I think would be great to post um, along with the interview is uh, um, if, if you want to think about um, any, anyone that you're listening to either on social media or music or podcasts or whatever um that uh, that we can share with the audience that would be great we'll, we'll ask you for like a little like list of people yeah, be looking into. I have a, yeah i have a huge list so i'm uh yeah it's interesting in this time of being on social media so much is like i've been checking myself as far as like what's performative in like mm -hmm. what am i am i virtue signal, signaling with me being like okay i'm posting things related to race and related to these, you know, trending topics, which they're not trending. It's, it, this is literally, it should be trending all the time. This should be something we talk about constantly. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, I realized I kind of like had, I had some check-ins with some people and being like, you know, you have a different pool of people that listen to you. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that if you have something that's valuable to you and you've like educated yourself and you've done the research and you find it valuable something related to um, like anti-racist work, you know, there's tons of lists out there. There's like a million of like mm -hmm. books you should read, podcasts, movies, yada, yada, yada. But like you have a totally different audience on your platform that can see that, you know what I mean? And I've really been focusing on especially Denver and like Colorado related resources. Um, so that being said, um, yes, I would love to share some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Lindy. I yeah, appreciate thank you. your time and, and nice meeting you. And I look yeah. forward to seeing you in person someday soon. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you so much, Lindy. Um, it was great to talk to you. You're an amazing human, amazing artist. I respect mm -hmm. you so much. Well, thank you. So I appreciate it. And thank you, Alvin, for hosting and um, being yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, it was really <laughs> great provoking questions. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and Lindy, I'd, maybe I'll share with you that uh, that when we and I um, were talking about this, uh, she was so enthusiastic about about you and your work. So, um. oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate that, and I appreciate the support and the and the platform and to have these dialogues because um, it's important. And yeah, the whole the whole meaning behind things and why we are at the place we are and who we are is really important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your time, Wendy. We'll, uh, when we get this all kind of the tech piece out, um, yeah. we'll, we'll keep you posted on, um, on how to access it and share with people or whatnot. Awesome. Sweet. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.